fun. All right. Are we on? I think so. Usually there's more. All right. Okay. Yeah, there we are. I can see it. Okay, great. Okay, sometimes it just takes a minute. So I hope I'm on the right page. I think I did. If I if, okay. <laughs> Either way, we'll get people on in just a second, I'm sure. So welcome, everybody, to Healthy Living Live. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest today is Adam Sud. Adam is a health coach for the Whole Foods Total Immersions, as well as for the Mastering Diabetes Program. He also is a speaker at Rip Esselstyn's Engine 2 programs, and like myself, he is a fellow self-proclaimed sweet potato addict. So welcome to Healthy Living, Adam. Thank you so much. I'm um, really excited to be here. Me too. You know, I, in, in your honor, I wore these earrings today. Oh, okay. thank you. Exactly. Now, great, <laughs> before we get into who you are and your story, let's ask the most important question. As a sweet potato addict, what is your favorite kind of sweet potato and how do you prefer them prepared? So my favorite is Hawaiian. I love the, the white outside with that beautiful rich purple inside when you cut into it it's just like cutting into a galaxy of magic mm -hmm. and i i like it in two like two ways one simply baked with a little bit of cinnamon on top because i'm a simple guy i like simple food and the other way i really like it is in my oatmeal mm. love it so that good. sounds great actually sweet potato oatmeal yeah amazing do you, do you cook them like, do you just roast them? Do you cook them in the Instant Pot, uh, steam them, microwave them? Is there a preferred cooking method? Um, well, for so for the oatmeal, I just I boil them. Um, oh. And then when I'm just having regular uh, sweet potatoes, I just bake them. Do you eat sweet potatoes every day like me? Yes. Me too. As much as possible. You know, I figure if the longest lived people on the world eat something like 70% of their calories from sweet potatoes, the Okinawan is probably good for the rest of us. And they're amazing. They're so delicious. And they're, they're, the calorie density is like, it's perfect. You yep. can't overeat them. And when you, want, when you eat them, you always want more and it's not a problem. And so I just don't, like, I've never heard anything anywhere that shows me there's anything wrong with a sweet potato. It's nature's perfect food. It really is. Nature's perfect food. I always like, think about it. It's three, about 370 calories per pound. Right. 90% whole intact, incredibly healthy, beneficial carbohydrate, 8% protein, less than 2% fat, full of fiber and water and micronutrients, more potassium than a banana, as much vitamin C as an orange, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful <laughs> than a locomotive. <laughs> so, and they taste like cake. I mean, they really do taste like cake. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, who needs dessert when, when your meal is a sweet potato? Exactly. Uh, you know, people, when, they, when, when I coach people and they say, well, I miss, you know, experience eating cookies. If you slice your sweet potato into little medallions, dust them with cinnamon, you've got a cinnamon cookie that you can eat and you can take with you and you can have, and it's perfect. So, yeah, I love it. It really is the perfect food. So it, it, I love to, uh, to, to connect with a fellow sweet potato lover. So I'm going to let you talk a little bit because I'm, I'm not sure all my viewers are familiar with your story, which is a wonderful story. And I encourage you guys to listen to his stories on, on some of the other interviews he did. So to prepare for this interview, I literally put your name into Google and listen to every interview Adam Sud ever did. And I'm going to recommend my, my two personal favorites just happen to be the Rich Roll podcast where Adam gives his phone number. So don't call him, even if you listen to that one. Yeah, that was a mistake. And I love the interview you did with the Big Change film on YouTube. I, I really like those. But in case somebody's unfamiliar with your work, just, just briefly tell us who you are in your story and what led you here today. Sure. So I grew up in Texas. I'm actually a seventh generation Texan and I'm a Jew. So I grew up eating burgers and barbecue and bagels and blintzes. Uh, I like to describe it as the standard American diet wearing cowboy boots with chutzpah. Um, and look, I had a great childhood. I had friends, I played sports. Um, my, I ate the diet of my culture and the culture was telling me that this is what you're supposed to eat. So I appreciate that. I appreciate people who have, have cultural connections to their food. Um, but growing up, I had a few things that really profoundly affected me. And one is my relationship with my father. When my dad was 25 years old. His father passed away pretty quickly as a, from a diagnosis of uh, colon cancer. And as a result of losing his father, that trauma, in my opinion, uh, causes him to be uh, very fearful when he sees people that he loves engaging in lifestyle behaviors that are threatening to their health. And, uh, and, and very 
almost every day lifestyle behaviors that can be threatening to their health. It makes them fearful. When he becomes fearful, he becomes hypercritical. So I was criticized a lot as a kid for eating foods that most kids want to eat. And what confused me was those foods were in our house. And so I was confused as to why the foods that my parents were offering me, I was being criticized for wanting, and I started to feel bad about myself, and I became a closet eater at a very young age, where I would take food from the kitchen, go into my bedroom, turn off the lights, sit in the closet or in the corner, and I would eat in the dark because I was afraid and I was ashamed of being seen for who I was. That I believed that my behaviors were me, and my behaviors were shameful. The other thing was I was diagnosed with ADHD um, and I was put on Ritalin. So I had a doctor essentially telling me that, okay, well, there's something about you that the world doesn't think works properly. So just take this pill and it'll be fine. Again, nothing about who I am as a person, distinguishing the difference between behavior and who I was as a person. So here I was being told by a doctor, I'm broken. And if I'm broken, I take pills. And that really affected me to where after that, I believe that when I saw something about myself that people didn't like, or that didn't fit in with whatever I was doing, I had to find something to put into myself to fix it. And in high school, Ritalin became Adderall, and I can remember the first time I used Adderall as a recreational drug, I was hooked like that. Because Adderall is medically pure amphetamine. That's what it is. It made me this type A personality I thought my dad wanted me to be. It allowed me to control my weight, I was a very self-conscious person as a result of having self-image and eating issues. Uh, it allowed me to be the life of the party at any party, stay up for days at a time. It was just this rush. When I took it, I felt like I was invincible and it was magically fixing everything I thought the world thought was wrong with me. And it worked for me. In high school, it worked. And I got a scholarship to the college I wanted to go to. But as a result of abusing the drug, for an extended period of time, when I got to college, I started to need more and more and more of it. And my classes and my friends and my passions became less and less important. And I went to college with all this intention of discovering who I was as an adult, following these passions. But as a sophomore in college, I dropped out, moved back to Austin, Texas, and became a criminal drug addict. I was <laughs> really was i was a, i was dealing drugs i was stealing from people i was scamming doctors i had four doctors at one point prescribing me the same medication it's called doctor shopping it's a felony i was altering and forging prescriptions these are other felonies there were so many occasions where i was at the pharmacy and they would get on the phone and make phone calls because they were so sure that i was scamming them i don't know how i never got arrested i'm very thankful that i didn't I actually, I actually my last question. How did you manage to escape ever, you know, going to jail for this? I really don't know because a few of the doctors found out what was going on, and instead of reporting me, they just got rid of me as a patient. And um, I'm very, very lucky. Um, I also became incredibly depressed because I was isolating and didn't talk to my friends. I avoided my family except to borrow money. We'd get in these horrible fights with my parents. Um, the only person I was ever talking to was my twin brother. My sister wasn't talking to me. She was so afraid and couldn't stand to hear me when I was high, and I was high all the time. Um, I also started to develop an addiction to fast food. And when I say I was a fast food addict, I'm going to explain to you what I ate on a daily basis. I get up every single day, and I would go to a breakfast taco stand, and I would get four potato, egg, and cheese breakfast tacos. For my first lunch, I go to McDonald's, get two double quarter pounder, supersized double quarter pounder meals. For my second lunch, I go to Whataburger, which is a, another fast food chain, and I would get the extra large honey barbecue chicken strip sandwich meal. For dinner, an extra large pizza with beef from Papa John's with a side of the chicken strips with the honey mustard dipping sauce. At three in the morning, I'd go back to Whataburger for four of their breakfast on a bun sausage, egg and cheese sandwiches. I would drink about 15 to 20 sodas a day. And when I say I was addicted to Adderall, the average prescription for Adderall is somewhere between 20 and 30 milligrams, give or take. Uh, by the last five years or so of my addiction, I was doing 450 milligrams in a 24 hour period. I would stay up for six days at a time. Uh, I would start to develop drug induced, uh, like obsessive compulsive tics, sort of getting myself into these psychotic episodes. I can remember one time when it was so bad that 
I couldn't stand to feel the hair touch the back of my ears. And I stay up all night brushing my hair forward and back, brushing it off of my ear. And I was brushing it so hard that when I, when I went into the bathroom the next morning, all the hair on the side of my head was gone wow. because I had completely brushed it off. Now, luckily, at about this time, I, I think at this time I was like 300, around 300 to 320 pounds. I was almost at my heaviest. How tall are you, Adam? I'm 5'10". Wow. So I was big. Um, my dad, who's been involved with Whole Foods Market for a long time, and Whole Foods Market had just partnered with Rip Esselstyn and created this Total Health Engine 2, Total Health Immersion Program. My dad came to me and he said, Adam, I really want you to go to this. He thought that if I could learn how to take care of my myself and, and my physical self, if I could lose weight, if I could start to feel better about myself and get some confidence, that maybe I could accept my drug addiction. And uh, he begged me to go. And I'll be honest, the only reason I said yes was because I knew that if I said yes, he would continue to give me money. <laughs> and I went to the engine to emerge, and that's where you and I first met. Right, in 2000, it was uh, February 2010 or March 2010. Yeah, and I don't know if you know this, but when I was there, I was a drug addict. I brought drugs to the immersion and I was using at the immersion. I did not know that. You were very quiet, I remember. Yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I sat in the back of every room and I avoided everybody, but I went to every single lecture and I listened to everything that was being said and I, and I agreed with all of it. And it spoke to me from a very personal level, uh, growing up an animal lover and uh, my you know, my connection to the natural world has always been something very special to me. So this spoke to me. And remember, I remember Dick Beardsley spoke the last night of that immersion. And he talked about how after his career as a marathoner, he suffered those horrific injuries on his farm where he got caught up in machinery and got addicted to pain drugs. And I listened to him tell a story of addiction and talk about how he treated people as an addict. And I really thought that that night was going to be the first time that I was going to go up to somebody and admit that I was a drug addict and I needed help because I thought if anybody, if there's anyone in my life that I know of at this moment that will hear me say I'm an addict and need help and not judge me for it, it's another addict. And I can remember standing next to his table as he was signing books, wanting so badly to take one more step to get close enough to him to talk, wanting to say something to just start the conversation and I couldn't, I was frozen. I was so afraid that if I said the words, I'm an addict, that I would actually finally hear it for the first time and it would be real. And I wasn't desperate enough and I left, you know, walking down the path of fear. Um, but about a year later, I was coming home from shopping at Casual Mail XL because I had a 50 inch waist. Um, and I dropped my bags and I went to the bathroom and I took my shirt off and I just stared at myself in the mirror. And I was a hoarder. I wasn't showering or brushing my teeth for months at a time. I had rashes all over my body, rashes that were full, uh, developing under the folds of my skin. I had sores and stretch marks. And I was staring at this shape in the mirror that I didn't recognize as myself. And I just started to hit myself as hard as I could over and over and over again until I had all these welts all over my body. I was yelling, I hate you, I hate you, into the mirror. I collapsed on the floor, floor crying. And my brother and I are incredibly close. We're identical twins. And he and I have experienced depression together for a long time growing up um, for various reasons. And there was a time when we were in college when I turned to him, and it was amazing you know, to have this conversation with him, to think that things got that bad. And I said, Bobby please promise me no matter how bad things get that you will never ever commit suicide because I'll never be able to live my life without you. And he looked at me and said, I need you to make the same promise to me. And that night I broke that promise because I attempted suicide by overdose. And um, I popped a bunch of pills. I stood up, I vomited, passed out, face down on the floor in a pile of fast food garbage in a puddle of vomit surrounded by empty pill bottles with nobody around me in a dark, filthy apartment. Not because my family didn't want to be there to help me, but because I had shut everything and everyone out of my life. My windows were boarded up with like cardboard because I didn't want 
any light getting into my apartment, anyone, anybody being able to see me. Luckily, I regained consciousness and had this surreal awareness of self where I realized that if I continue doing this, that my parents, who have given me everything in the world, my mom, who inspired my imagination, and my dad, who's taught me everything about the importance of being honest and having integrity and being selfless, and my twin brother, who is literally my other half, and my sister, Jewel, these people spending the rest of their lives asking themselves why I needed to eat and drug myself to death. And I decided I wasn't going to let that happen. I picked up the phone. I called my dad. And I asked for help. And I didn't realize this till last year, but my suicide attempt was on August 21st of 2012. My dad's birthday is August 28th. If I had been successful for his 60th birthday, he and my family would have been burying me, sitting at a funeral, burying their son for his 60th birthday. Wow. That, that's absolutely incredible. And I'm so glad that the outcome was the outcome and you're inspiring so many people. I, th there's some comments I want to read to you and some questions. But what I'm wondering, Adam, is looking back now, what do you think was missing? If, if something had been different, like I, I know it's, it's probably yeah. it almost sounds like a trivial question because there's probably not one thing. But when you look back, it, it, it was how you felt about yourself, because obviously you came from a very loving family. You yeah. what what? Because I always like to know, like, well, what you know? Like if this was a movie, what was that that pivotal thing that, that made you go down the road that you did? It was self-worth. I had none of it. And not one behavior in my life created any of it, right? There wasn't one action that's, that, that I did during the course of the day that said to myself, I love you. This is about self-care and self-love. Not one thing that I did during the day emphasized to myself that I mattered and I have worth. And every action was actually doing the opposite. And it just kept going down and down and down and down until I hit rock bottom. Right. But well, looking at you now, you know, like Daisy writes that she logged on late. And she says, looking, look at this healthy, slim young man. You wouldn't imagine what he was saying, you know, that, that yeah. I mean, she, we believe you, but that about your previous weight and your addictions that everyone is saying, what a transformation. But they do want to know, you said you're 5'10". They want to know what your highest weight is, how much you lost. Uh, that's what all my viewers are very interested in, the weight loss aspect of your journey. Yeah, the most I ever saw on the scale was 320-ish. Um, I never stepped on the scale after that because I didn't want to see it any higher. So I don't believe I was over 350, but I don't know my exact highest weight. And when I checked into rehab, you're not allowed to look at the scale when they weigh you. Interesting. Uh, so today I weigh 150 to 155 pounds. So let's let's call it 320 uh, to, uh, you know. So it's about 170 Plus pounds, somewhere yeah, in there. So you lost, you lost more than half, at least half your weight. That's yeah. uh, eating potatoes, by the way, everybody. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, because when I checked into rehab in the first forty-eight hours, I got diagnosed with type two diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, erectile dysfunction, which I already knew about, um, uh, anxiety disorder, sleep disorder, bipolar disorder, suicidal depression, and attention deficit disorder, and I was put on a cabinet of medication. And luckily, I had been able, I had the fortune of attending the engine to immersion and hearing people like yourself tell me that if I were to do this one simple thing, simply change what I put on my plate, that all of these diagnoses I just received couldn't go away. That yes, I was 100% responsible for the fact that I was sitting in that doctor's office in rehab listening to him say, you have these diagnoses. But because I was the cause of my problems, I get to be the solution. I don't have to wait for anyone or anything else to change for me to start making my life better. And that realization is what really got me moving forward in my recovery. Because look, at the end of the day, addiction and depression, these are very intangible things. There's no, it's not chartable. I can't wake up my, in the morning and prick my finger and see how addicted I am or how depressed I am. But I can sure check my blood pressure in the morning, check my blood sugar in the morning. I can get on a scale. I avoided the scale for about six months. But these things are measurable. And there's an A plus B equals C result with this. If I change my diet, if I move my body, this will happen. My, my health will get better. 
and I believed it. And so when I moved out of rehab and moved into sober living, I decided I was going to transition to a plant-based diet. And it wasn't easy. Luckily, there's an amazing guy who gave this incredible TED Talk called The Pleasure Trap. And when I heard The Pleasure Trap, everything about the way that I was able to see what was in front of me changed. He talked about how we are motivated by pleasure through pain avoidance, energy conservation, and pleasure seeking. These are the three things that motivate all organisms, right? And when we eat food, no matter what the food is, we're going to get some form of pleasure response. And the purpose of pleasure is to indicate to ourselves that we have found something in the environment that's biologically beneficial for us. Unfortunately, in the modern environment, we have foods that trigger such a dopamine response that we can't help but be compelled to continue doing that because our body literally believes we have just done something that is so beneficial, so helpful to ourselves as a physical person that we have to continue doing it. He talked about the rat in the cage study where you give a rat a choice between water and cocaine and the rat will, once the rat tries the cocaine, it will continue to do the cocaine over and over and over again and then in about 12 days it's gonna be dead. But if we pause and think from a subjective point of view what's taking place inside that animal's mind, that he's thinking and feeling, that he's being incredibly biologically beneficial, being very incredibly biologically successful when in fact he's self-destructing. When I understood that, everything changed because it helped me realize that if I could just get up every single day and be comfortable being uncomfortable, eventually I would wake up and this new lifestyle would not be a chore. Eventually I would wake up and I would look forward to eating beans and potatoes and kale and fruit. And then one day I would wake up and the idea of ever going back to the foods I was eating before would make me as uncomfortable as I felt in that moment having to change to this new way of eating. I knew that. I was certain of it. And so I told myself, if I'm going to change, I have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And it wasn't easy, but it helped me realize that when I get up every single day and I prepare a meal on a plate that is about health and wellness, that is about me becoming a healthier version of myself today than the person I was the day before, that's an act of self-care. That is an act of self-love. That is me saying to myself, today I choose to recover. It's an affirmation of sobriety. And in about six months, I completely reversed my type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and erectile dysfunction. And I remember walking out of the doctor's office, my endocrinologist's office, and saying to him, I no longer need your services. And I felt something that I hadn't felt in ages, self-worth. And that self-worth made me feel like no matter what was going to come up in my way, because I was still dealing with a lot of emotional stuff, no matter what was going to happen, I was worth saving because I am making change in my life. Within 10 months, I lost over 100 pounds, and within a year, I was off of every single medication I was put on in rehab, including the antidepressants, mood stabilizers, sleeping medications, anxiety medications, and ADHD medication. As of today, I've lost over 170 pounds. And I have become a speaker for Rip Esselstyn's uh, Engine 2 events. I get to work with the amazing Mastering Diabetes team with Robbie and Cyrus and Tara and Satari. And, uh, and I work for Whole Foods Market's Total Health Immersions team. But there's probably the most profound things that I've learned is that if I did not identify my why, none of this was going to happen. And... Yeah, sure, I was a type 2 diabetic who was obese and I was a drug addict and I almost died. Those are great, right? I could say, well, I don't want to be a diabetic anymore and I don't want to be obese anymore. Okay, fine, but I don't think anybody who's a diabetic wants to be. And I don't think very many people who are obese want to be obese. And I'm pretty sure that most people don't want to die. Why not? What is it about my life that I loved so much that I was willing to be comfortable being uncomfortable in order to experience those things more completely, more authentically, and from the healthiest place I've ever been. The diagnoses weren't the problem. The only two problems I ever had in life were I didn't know how to live as an emotional or physical person. Those diagnoses, all they did was showed me what I loved most about my life and what was worth fighting for. That was my why. That was what allowed me to get it every single day and decide, make that choice between what I want now and what I want most. 
And there's a quote that says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act but a habit. If I got up every single day and I ate a plant-based diet, and if I got up every single day and I was committed to my recovery, and if I could get up every single day and be of service to one person, then at the end of that day, I was a happy, healthy, sober person who was of service to other people. And that's the type of person I want to be. And in order to be that, I have to do it every single day. And I, look, I know one thing about myself. I'm a really good addict. I'm a really talented addict. When I was a drug addict, if I was out of drugs, I could get it. I knew who to scam, I knew who to cheat, I knew who to buy drugs from, I could deal, I could, whatever it took, I would get it. I was never more productive as in those moments when I needed drugs. All I did was I took a very, very destructive addiction and I adopted a very, very constructive addiction. If you think I'm any less addicted to this lifestyle, you're crazy. I am right, very right. much a plant-based addict. The difference is my drug addiction kept me in a hoarder-like apartment with no one around me, a life this big where I was dying on the floor. My new addiction has opened up a world to me that I never imagined possible. And it has allowed me to connect with people in a way that I've never been able to before. Everything about the way that I move through the world is completely different. My certainties are gone. The way I interact with people, the way that people can interact with me, the way I allow myself to accept people is completely different. And I really believe that the simplest change on your fork can make the most profound change of your life. I know it did for me. And I've seen it work for my twin brother, who in 2016 was like 280 pounds. He was a type 2 diabetic. And I asked him to come live with me and just live my lifestyle for six months. And let's see what happens. Well, it didn't even take six months. He reversed his diabetes in like six weeks. And he's under 200 pounds. And... He's, you know, I've seen him find purpose and passion in life that I hadn't seen in him for a long time. And I'm to be able to, to be able to give something like that to a person I love more than anyone in the world and watch the, watch the life come back into him is I'll never do anything better in my life. And, uh, sorry. And then just share a passion for health and food and connectivity with every other living creature on the planet with someone that you love more than anyone else and that you have a connection with more so than anyone else has just been the most incredible experience in my life. So, sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. I'm always so jealous, jealous, jealous of like you and Nina and Nelson and Rand and Rand are wonderful twins. <laughs> People are loving your story, Adam. They're saying things like, you rock. Uh, Ivana says, your story is inspiring, restores her faith in humanity. Diana loves your shirt. I can't really see what it is. It's a red shirt. It says oh, enjoy oh, I, Now I see the whole thing. Yeah. Terrific. Um, That's Cheryl, actually Aranya says, you're amazing. Uh, Cheryl says, your story brings so much of the learning we've all gained together. Uh, again, I'm hearing amazing, amazing. Angela says, you have her in tears. So everybody's loving this. And, and um, Angela says, crying with you. Uh, Sherry wants to hug you right now. So all these, you can read these uh, later, but all these wonderful comments. One of the things I want to ask you about your experience in rehab, because in one of your interviews, you call the standard American diet substance abuse, which I love yeah. that. But yet that was what was served to you in rehab. Yes, it is. I, I truly believe that the standard American diet is the deadliest form of substance abuse on the planet. Not just because it kills more people per year than any other, than all drug overdoses combined by over 10 times, but it's socially encouraged. In fact, you're called weird and crazy if you do anything other than that. Um, yes, it's what I was served in rehab. Yes, because most of the time when you check into rehab, all they want you to do is get off your illegal or destructive substance abuse that uh, substances that are deemed unfit for society right socially unacceptable addictions that's all they want to get you off of and it's sad and it's tragic because i i know for a fact that my life and my recovery has benefited from the fact that i went whole food plant-based i know for a fact that my ability to repair the damage that i did to myself physically as a drug addict was improved by removing the inflammation from my body, by putting these incredibly nutritious and vital foods into my body and healing from the inside out, I was able to make profound changes in recovery. 
And it's a shame because we have uh, a system that says, I don't care how sick this food makes you as long as we get you off your drugs. Because that's the goal. Just get them off the alcohol, the, you know, the heroin, the whatever they're on. As long as you're doing that, I don't care what you put in your body. That's, I guarantee you one thing. You go to an AA meeting tonight, there'll be cigarettes, coffee, and donuts. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, there you go. There you have it. It's, and, and it's not to any one person's fault. It's just a systematic thing, thing that, is, that has evolved on its own. And I think that with the understanding that we now have, with the information that we now have about the power of food, we should that, that that it should be a part. It should be it should be part of recovery. It should be a whole recovery. If the environment is sick, then it doesn't matter how much medicine you throw on it. If the environment is sick, the person will always be sick. And with a plant based diet, you have an opportunity to create an environment for positive change on a daily basis. So Simon Sinek says that when the environment is right, everyone has the capacity for remarkable change. And I think that that's exactly what a plant-based diet is. It's an environment for remarkable change. When I was coming home from therapy, because I did intensive outpatient therapy five days a week for like four, four, four and a half months, I would come home for the first few months pissed at the world, pissed at my father, pissed at everyone else, pissed at the system. Never, not, I, I wasn't able to, to focus on me because I hadn't, I hadn't developed enough self worth at that time. But I can tell you one thing: if I am, chose to emotionally eat a low fat plant based diet, at the end of the day, I was still healthier than the day before, because my diet did not ever allow me to put anything into my body that created anything more than positive change. I know I'm an emotional eater. So if I'm an emotional eater, I am never going to allow my emotions to put anything into my body that isn't going to cause positive change in terms of my health. That's what a plant-based diet did for me. That's amazing. Uh, Linda said that SAD should also stand for substance abuse diet. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that. Yep. That's so good. Yep. Yeah, well, together you guys coined a great, a great new acronym. Do, do you, you know, what's interesting is because you were a drug addict and a food addict, a lot of the people I deal with in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, they don't have a, a problem with any kind of drugs or, or alcohol, but they find that people that have, and I'm doing this in air quotes, more severe addictions like drugs and alcohol, they look at us like, well, you, that's not really an addiction and it's no big deal. But I find that people suffer just as much without drug addictions if they have food addictions and people have actually taken their life because of food addiction. What do you think about that? And do you think you were a food addict before you became a drug addict and maybe just didn't know it? I think I know for, for a fact I, I was always an addict to some kind of substance and food was it for me at first. Uh, and and I think that they sort of happened at the same time because the Adderall allowed me to be a food addict and in high school keep the weight off. Um, but look, food and drugs, food and addiction and drug addiction operate in the same place in the brain. It's, it's all the same thing. The thing is, is that the substance is never the issue. The substance is simply the symptom of the underlying cause, right? So for me, it became food and drugs. It can be sex, it can be gambling, it can be shopping, whatever triggers that dopamine response and gives you something emotionally that the rest of your life isn't giving you. When I came home from McDonald's with a bag of cheeseburgers and I crawled onto my couch and covered myself in my blanket and turned on the TV and took a bite of that burger, I felt like I was being hugged. Like this burger was saying, don't worry about anything else I'm going to make sure that you feel you feel good about yourself and give you this nice warm hug and don't worry just go to sleep. And nothing else about my life was able to do that. If I walked outside it was like a glaring mirror in front of my face saying this is what how you do not fit in. You are not But if you don't want to accept anything you're just going to fight back. And so every interaction was not a conversation it was a confrontation. Everything else about my life was saying you're broken except food and drugs. Drugs made me feel superhuman and food made me feel loved. That's what it was giving me. And so, yes, absolutely, food is very powerful. And I would never separate the two. Like I said, I just think that food is socially accepted to a point where people say, oh, they're not addicts, they just don't know how to control themselves. Right. 
Like, how dismissive is that? It's like calling somebody crazy. You don't know yeah. them. You don't know what they're dealing with. You don't know what environment they live in. Don't be so dismissive. Well, thank you for saying that because I find uh, uh, sometimes people that don't suffer from a food addiction but suffer from other addictions marginalize us and say, well, you know, your addiction is just not as bad. You don't really know what it's like to be addicted. And like you say, it feels the same. The substance may be different and maybe the degree of the damage you're doing to other people may be different, but it feels the same. And at, and at the end of the day, I can say, you know what? Maybe it's not. I'm still suffering. Right. That's all that matters. One of the things you say that I love is there's a difference between recovery and sobriety. Yes. Yeah. So when I was in rehab and I got diagnosed with all these diseases, um, I decided that I could never be sober. I mean, I could never recover unless I changed everything about my life. Sure. I could stop using the drugs and be sober and be dead in five years because my lifestyle was killing me. The food, everything about the way I talked to people and treated people, the way I isolated from the world, the way I was angry all the time, these things were going to kill me. And if I didn't change everything, I would die sober in five years. I didn't want that. I wanted to recover. And in order to do that, I had to change everything about the way that I was living my life in order to become the most authentic version of myself that I that I think I can be. And I think that that is something that you constantly are, are searching for because you're, you change on a, uh, on a daily basis. You learn new things. You experience new things. Your, your worldviews change. And so that authentic self is a daily quest. And in order for me to discover that, I have to come at the day from a very honest and open place and without with, with, with as little self-destructive behavior as possible. So for me, in order to recover, I could not just be sober. That's amazing. Somebody wants to know where you got your shirt. Is it an Engine 2 shirt? And can they get it on the Engine 2 website? It is an Engine 2 shirt. I don't believe we sell it anymore. Oh, darn, darn. So I think of all the things you've said, one of my favorite things is that preparation trumps motivation. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I couldn't agree with you more. Yes, absolutely. Motivation is an emotion. And like all emotions, they're fleeting. It's there one day, it's gone the next. You cannot depend on motivation, but you can depend on preparation. I knew exactly what I was going to eat every single day when I woke up for a week, a month ahead of time, so that when I went into the kitchen to make my meal, I was prepared. I had everything I needed, and I knew exactly. I just walked in, followed my, my, uh, my routine. I went in, I made this, and I walked out. That way, if I was emotionally compromised and I walked into the kitchen to make a meal and I didn't have what I needed, my chances for making a, a destructive decision would be much higher than normal. But if I'm emotionally compromised but prepared with my food, I can walk in, be comfortable being uncomfortable, eat what I need to eat, and leave successful. Because preparation is how you are going to make sure on a daily basis you have what you need to be successful, motivated or not. Because motivation is great when you feel good, but it goes really quickly when you're having a bad day. Absolutely. There's, um, I believe it was Zig Ziglar who says motivation is like bathing. Neither lasts very long. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Right. So a lot of people are asking if you've written a book or are you plan to write a book? I have just submitted a proposal to um, uh, some publishing houses on a book called Plant Based Addict, My Journey from Pills to Plants. So hoping, yes, I'm writing a book. Uh, great. Well, that's excited. terrific because you've got you've got such a great story. So I want to ask you a question about, about the environment. In the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, I'm known for a saying: if it's in your house, it's in your mouth, and it's not a question of if you will eat it, just when. But people fight me about this because they're living in families where maybe the spouse doesn't want to eat this way, or the kids, and so they're not only having non-compliant food in the house; they're forced to buy it and prepare it for their family, and, and they're right. continually relapsing and not having results. So I want to ask you, how important do you think as a recovering food and drug addict, one's environment is to one's ultimate success on any kind of recovery program? I think the environment is incredibly important. Uh, I think if you think about it, environment is probably the most 
impactful thing in your life in terms of your daily choices because they are your environment is what offers you your choices. So look, for the first 10 months after rehab, I was in sober living. And in sober living, the food was a nightmare. And I created a cabinet for myself, a, sh a shelf for myself, and a shelf for myself in the, in the refrigerator that was mine. It had my foods in it, my foods were there, and I said that when I eat, that's where I go. And look, it wasn't easy, and, and the thing is, I completely understand that it's tough when you're surrounded by people who are doing things that you are trying to give up, and you still feel compelled to do it. It comes down to just, you have to want it. And I'm not saying that you don't, but this is serious stuff we're talking about. This is literally life and death decisions on a daily basis. Those decisions change the trajectory of your health from being 80 years old and sick and in bed and on medications to being 80 years old and running around with your grandkids. And it only gets to that point. The only way you're, that you can create a, uh, a trajectory of health where the possibility of you being 80 and running around with your grandkids is in your favor is by doing daily consistent actions of self-care. And I'm not saying you have to be perfect because nobody's perfect, but we are strong enough to that when we fall down and make a mistake, it's not really a mistake, it's an opportunity to learn. Whenever you're starting a new lifestyle, in my opinion, there's two opportunities, two situations that can happen at the end of the day. You can have a great day where nothing goes wrong and you stick to the diet and you're 100% compliant and you end the day and woohoo, great. Those, those are great days. But what's even better is days that you get up and nothing is easy. And you either eat something that isn't 100% compliant and you learn. It's not a failure. It's a learning experience. Or you get through it anyways. Those are the best days because only when you're uncomfortable are you creating a new uh, a new lifestyle. Are you changing yourself? It's only in discomfort that we change. And so, I mean, I told myself every single day when I got up, today is probably going to be very, very hard. And not only was it probably going to be hard, I was planning on it. I needed to be uncomfortable because I needed so badly to have daily opportunities to change my life. I was grateful for the opportunity to be uncomfortable on a daily basis. And so, yeah, I think that if you can, one, write out your goals for yourself. And I don't mean lose weight, reverse diabetes. Of course, that's what you want to, you want to have happen. But what matters most to you? Write those down. Put them on your refrigerator. Put a sign on your cabinet. Put a sign in your bedroom that says, I want to be 80 and run around with my grandkids. I want to experience as much time on this earth with my brother as possible. Um, say that I want to connect with my father in a way that I've never done before. I want to run with my dad. Like if, that's a, if, that, if that would make your life wonderful, write that on a piece of paper and put it around your house as a daily reminder because things are never going to be easy. But there are things that are worth going through with difficult moments in order to uh, achieve a life that you've always imagined you wanted and that is possible for anybody. Thank you. I just put on the screen, I typed plant-based addict on Instagram if people want to follow you. Are there, is there any other way for people to follow you or, or hear you speak in the, in the near future? Sure. So actually, I'm going to be speaking at Plant Stock. Um, so if you go to engine2.com and look at the events, um, there's an event called Plant Stock that happens in August. Um, and it's, it's this amazing uh, location in Asheville, North Carolina. And Dr. Greger is speaking. Kim William, Williams is speaking. Silas Rao, the environmental guy, is speaking. Uh, Nina and Randa Nelson are speaking. Um, uh, uh, Michelle McMacken, I believe, is speaking. Uh, um, uh, no, uh, and Robin Shukan is speaking. It's, it's an incredible event. And it's three days with uh, Dr. Esselstyn is speaking. Rip will be speaking. So it is like the, 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 the Woodstock of the plant-based world. Um, so I'll be speaking there in August. Um, right now, if you go to masteringdiabetes.org backslash summit, there is a summit that is free to view for the next few days with 35 experts talking about the power of plant-based nutrition. And, and I did an interview for that as well. So people can, can watch that. Um, 
yeah, you can follow me on Facebook uh, at Plant Based Addict, and you can um, uh, follow me on Instagram at Plant Based Addict. Great. Thank you, Adam. So many, so many kind comments, wonderful comments. Poppy saying she's been so discouraged. Thank you for, for uh, talking to us now. Mary says you're awesome speaking the truth. Thank you. So what I love, one of the things I loved about you is you're, you, you don't live in California, but you're visiting your brother now. And I said, well, then if we're in the same time zone, come over and we'll do some cooking. And you said, well, I'm just, I just eat sweet potatoes. And I love that. Because so do I. I mean, I eat vegetables too, but talk a little bit about how simplicity is important when people recover from food addiction. Yeah, um, I think that simplicity is it's so important because it allows for less. So this is new. When people transition to a plant-based diet, the kitchen can be a place of resentment because the food is unfamiliar, the cooking processes are unfamiliar. So if you're doing all these complicated recipes, it can create resentment in the kitchen where you're getting frustrated and then you say, well, I don't know, I can't cook like this, why am I doing this? And when I got started, I made it very clear to myself that I am not trying to make every single recipe in the plant, low-fat plant-based world. That is not my, the purpose for me is changing my, my, my diet. The reason I'm doing this is to reverse disease, lose weight, gain health and vitality in a way that I've never had before. In order to do that, I just have to eat a low-fat plant-based diet. So I pretty much ate the same thing every single day. And I looked at it as a way of, uh, in a way of saying, I'm not doing this for the rest of my life, but I'm going to do this for a series of seven day experiments over and over again. Cause I can do this for seven days. And then at the end of those seven days, I'm going to look and say, well, this worked and this didn't. I liked this and I didn't like this. What can I do differently to continue moving forward? Because it's impossible to ask anybody to do anything for the rest of their lives. It's too big of an idea for you to comprehend. But I guarantee you, if you try right now and say, what does the rest of my week look like? You can you can envision that. You can see that. That's doable. That's that's something you can actually visualize in your head. It's it's a concept that is that it is, you can plan and you can see. So that's the way I look at it. Is that I don't know what's coming up for the rest of my life. I'm pretty sure right now that I'm never going to stop eating a low fat plant based diet. But I guarantee you, I'm going to do it for today. That's and that's it, terrific. Keeping it you simple know, is the best way to do it. I get up every single day. I have my oatmeal with cinnamon. I have a sweet potato with frozen. Like for lunch today, I literally, for lunch today, I had two pounds of frozen mango just because it was there and it was great. Uh, and then I'm going to have sweet potatoes for snacks and dinner. And I keep it simple because it's easy and it tastes good and I love it. Absolutely. And then you don't have to think about it. It's just it, 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 as long as you have the food prepared, like you said, preparation trumps motivation. As long as the food's prepared. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, well, yeah. we're almost out of time. So if you could just please tell the people that are struggling, maybe give them, I mean, obviously there is always hope. Like you've said, as long as you're breathing, there's always hope. But we have people, even in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, that have trouble, they can't even quit cigarettes and or, or alcohol, let alone, you know, eat, eat a vegetable. So you have come from hell and back. And how can you inspire people that are having such a hard time giving up whatever their addiction is, or even just getting started. Okay, um, I'm gonna tell you something. There's nothing special about me. I am a human. Everybody who is watching this right now is a human. There's nothing that separates me from anybody. The only reason why I'm able to get up every single day and eat a low-fat plant-based diet for every single meal is because I decided I want to. Want is the only secret in this. If you can tell yourself that you want to, then that is the driving motivation. That is the secret. Like you, yourself, you don't get, you, there's nothing like, you don't have some superpower. You get up every morning and you do this because you want to. You decided that this matters. And there's nothing about me or you that makes us capable of something that anyone else on here cannot do. It's a daily decision between what you want most and what you want now and what you want most. Make that decision. Identify what it is about your life that you love. Because, yes, fear is a great catalyst for short-term change. It, it does. It motivates us to see what we're going to lose in our life that we love so much. Because love is the strongest catalyst for long-term change. And identify that why. Put a plan into action. Be prepared because motivation will come and go. And get up and tell yourself how much you want this. Because when you want it, you'll do it. 
That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, I, I can't think of uh, really a, a better note to end on. You're just so inspirational and, and motivational. I can see why you're a coach because you are so inspiring. Even even yeah. your story, irrespective, just just the way you are is just. I, I mean, I feel motivated. Just you know, I mean, I'm already doing it, and I want to do it now because because I'm talking to you. So people have loved you doing this. Thank you so much for the work you do. It's it's just been such a, a privilege interviewing you. I'm sorry it took so long. And uh, if you're in town any longer, let's get together and we can uh, share we can share a sweet potato. Yeah, mutual Sunday. In fact, I saw my dad is watching. I saw oh. that he yours. So hi, dad. Hi. And, uh, and then hi, that, Papa Sud. The woman Ivana that you mentioned earlier uh, is this fabulous woman named Ivana Grahovic, who after listening to the ritual podcast, she's a person in long-term recovery herself. She is now a vegan and she nice. is such a powerful force in wanting to change the recovery world to a vegan movement. And so guys, check her out. She's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Cause you know, I interviewed Kathleen de Maison who wrote potatoes, not Prozac. And she's the one, she's not vegan, but she discovered when she was running an alcoholic treatment center for men that they were eating the worst food imaginable when they were coming off alcohol, like, like right. donuts and things. And it, it always amazes me how the people that could benefit, it's not to say that if we give every addict in the world, a whole food plant-based diet, they wouldn't have their addiction, but they right. would, feel so much better and they wouldn't have the diabetes that you had and things like that. Right. And it seems that the people that could benefit most from this kind of nutrition, people in prison, people in rehab, children, old people are actually getting the worst nutrition. Exactly. And think about it. Think about a sober living facility or rehab facility that was 100% whole food plant based. You could say to this person, when you leave here, you have a very long road of recovery in terms of getting over your emotional issues and your, your substance abuse issues. But we can guarantee you this, because of the diet that we offer you here, when you leave, you will be healthier than right now. Imagine a facility that can guarantee that. There isn't one in the world that can do that. In my opinion, I have not seen a sober living or rehab facility that can do that. They can say that when you leave here, you are physically healthier in all aspects of chronic disease prevention and reversal, as well as emotional health in a trackable way we can guarantee you you'll be healthier when you leave. That's amazing. I mean, what an incredible, powerful tool that would be. It would be so cool if we could actually do studies where we took like two different sober living places or rehabs and fed one of them a plant-based diet and gave other ones the crap they were eating and see who would recover. I would, love, I would love to see that. And I know that this woman, Ivana Gohovic, she's amazing. She's part of the Facing Addiction campaign that's fighting the opioid epidemic. And she is just on, at every opportunity is saying, we need to be plant-based. We need to do this plant-based. So people like that, her are really going to make the change. That would be so cool. That is a place I would work at. I would work at a rehab place that was plant-based. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about it. Take the True North model and put it into a rehab facility and just see what happens. What, what What's the harm? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, what, what's the harm? They got to eat anyways. Let's, let's do this. Yeah. Well, your dad just wrote, so proud of Adam, all that he has overcome and the positive impact he has on so many. So, so first you, you gave your family hell, but now you're making them proud. So that's what every Jewish family wants, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Absolutely, I love it. The the barbecue and the brisket, that, that's terrific. Well, thank you so much for being here, Adam. I can't wait for your book to come out. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I feel like you're a kindred spirit. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Healthy Living Live. I'm Chef AJ, I make healthy taste delicious, but like Adam, I keep it really simple. Take care, everyone.